Amen. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to put out that uh, Denzel Washington uh, was going to be our, our guest speaker. But uh, I didn't want to confuse you guys because since Denzel and I look alike, you know, well, I should say he looks like me because I'm older. Yeah, now, uh, I have the, uh, uh, the privilege and uh, preaching the lesson this evening, or this morning. Well, I, I, it'll be evening by the time we're done. But, amen. <laughs> so I, the title of our lesson today is, What Does the Bible Say About Self-Righteousness? So, you know, let's talk about being self-righteous. So, you know, you might be a self-righteous hypocrite, if you judge the sins of others but overlook your own sins. You judge the sins of others based on your own criteria. You are more concerned about actions than heart attitudes. You are more interested in judging than restoring. You always have an excuse for everything about yourself. Now, in addition, you might be a self-righteous, self-idolater if other people don't know as much about the truth as you, other people don't obey God as well as you, and other people aren't quite as righteous as you. You know, Webster, Webster's definition on self-righteousness is, or self-righteous, is having or characterized by a certainty especially an unfounded one, that one is totally correct or morally superior. You know, some of the synonyms for uh, self-righteousness is holier than thou, self-satisfied, smug, too good to be true, pious, superior, and hypocritical. Now, the Bible defines self-righteousness as relying on one's own merits or righteousness as the grounds for their salvation and the reason for God to save them. So in other words, it's like, well, I'm so awesome that, I mean, there's no way God's not taking me to heaven. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm probably number one. But, and, and you know, we can laugh and all that stuff, but by our actions, sometimes we can, well, I won't talk about you, I'll talk about me. Sometimes I can come across that way that I'm just so awesome that, I mean, how can God overlook me? You know, but the Bible teaches the opposite in many places. You know, in, in, uh, in Ephesians 2.8, for example, it says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. You know, I, although... Any Christian understands that this is not possible because of our sinful nature. It is uh, a constant temptation to all of us to believe we are or can be righteous in and of ourselves. You know, I, in the New Testament, James and the Apostle Paul come down particularly hard on those who attempted to live in self-righteousness. So our first point is Jesus condemned our condemnation of self-righteousness. You know, Jesus was, uh, I think, especially hard in his treatment of the Jewish leadership of the time when it came to self-righteousness. In Matthew 23, you know, Jesus condemns the scribes and the Pharisees for rigidly adhering to their legalistic traditions in order to make themselves look better to others. So turn your Bibles to Matthew 23. Right. And uh, we're going to listen to Jesus talking to us. Right. Matthew 23, and we're going to start in verse 1. Right. And the Bible says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sat in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. You know, I, have you ever told someone 
to do as I say and not as I do. Now, I, I know parents, don't be, don't, don't be pretending like you never said that to your kid. <laughs> because, well, I mean, maybe you haven't, but I, I bet if I ask a show of hands, we'll see how many actually say that. You know, uh, the, the phrase, do as I say, not as I do, means to pay attention to someone's words or my words. Do what they're telling you to do rather than mimicking their actions. So it should mean the speaker is aware of their mistakes and admits their imperfection. You know, I, uh, this story, uh, and it goes a conversation between a father and his son. So the father says, I, son, I, I heard you got caught skipping school today. And the son says, yeah, fifth period is so boring and I just wanted to leave. So uh, I and a few friends decided to ditch after lunch. Father, well, you, you know, you can't cut school. I mean, you know, you need an education, you need to learn, and all these things, you know. And the son comes back and says, well, Dad, I hear you tell stories all the time about how you cut school when, when you were going to school. But the father says, well, do as I say and not as I do. You know, Jesus points out in Matthew 23 that all disciples are brothers and sisters serving one another. No individual disciple or a group of disciples is above any other. You know, we're not to set up rules and regulations or others to meet and by which we can judge them. You know, sure there are leaders and followers, but we are all equals in God's sight. The word of God applies to all of us, not just a few. You know, disciples do nothing to parade their own worth and power in front of others. You know, we must be God pleasers, not people pleasers. Right. Humble service, not holy, our worldly recognition identifies us as disciples. You know, in Matthew 23, verses 25 through 28, Jesus tells us that attitudes shape actions. Those whom Jesus had, uh, addressed prided themselves in outward pious actions, but their attitudes and goals were wickedness, were wicked. Judgment is certain for hypocrites who build their own reputation at any cost. You know, I, there's a story about this preacher, and the preacher and his wife, they're invited over to uh, one of their members' house for dinner. And the preacher and his wife were you know, they, they were seated at the living room, or on the living room couch. And so, uh, and then the host, you know, went to the kitchen and get some poo-poos and some drinks, something, you know. Well, the preacher noticed a piece of paper on the floor under the couch. So, you know, he picks it up and he begins to read it, and it was a list. And uh, the list went something like this. Dust off the big Bible and put it on the living room table. Be sure to remember the title and a few verses from Sunday's sermon. Do not yell at the kids. Be polite to the wife. Don't forget to pray for the food and throw in a few things that will impress the preacher. And if the preacher or his wife tells a joke, be sure to laugh. Now, you know, can you relate? I mean, you know, maybe not to the same exact thing here, but can you relate to how sometimes, you know, we want to put on the front, you know, when there's, oh, there's this spiritual guy coming or whatever. I mean, I, uh, I, I wouldn't call myself spiritual, but I remember going to a brother's household one time, not our current brother's household. Let me clarify that. And I knock on the door and, you know, brother comes, open the door and he says, Robbie. And then he shuts it. <laughs> And he goes, oh, 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 uh, uh, I'll be right back. Boom. So I'm standing there, you know, and, and, and you can hear all this scurry and stuff. <laughs> and then, you know, I don't know, a couple of minutes, and you open the door, oh, come in. You know, and they're all sitting there, you know, looking. I said, yeah. So, so I just walked to the kitchen. And said, hey, come here. Look at all these dishes. Oh, look at all them cockroaches. Do you have any ants? You know, I said, well, oh, well, well, we didn't get a chance. I said, well, I'll be back in about 
30 minutes, I'm sure you'll have time to clean it. So I left. Now, point is, why why they feel I have to put on that show for me? I mean, you know, and for us as disciples, you know, we can put the show on, but I think we can forget that God is 24-7. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he knows who we are, what we're doing. So we can fool others, but we can't fool him. Okay, turn to Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. Okay, Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. And the Bible says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone, Jesus told his parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his chest and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all of those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. You know, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector was specifically told by Jesus to some who trusted in themselves that were righteous and treated others with contempt. Jesus warned about hypocrisy in praying. He specified that praying for the ears of men gets the rewards of men. And it's pride that prevents prayer from achieving its purpose. Humility is a way to open communications with the merciful God. The Pharisee assumed his acceptance with God was based on his own actions, whereas the tax collector recognized that there was nothing in, in himself that would cause God to approve of him. You know, we must clothe ourselves with humility in our dealing with one another. Yeah. For God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble, 1 Peter 5.5. 5. Yeah. Repeatedly in the Gospels, you know, Jesus clashes with the Pharisees and the scribes about true righteous, righteousness. At the same time, though, Jesus spends a great deal of time and energy warning his disciples about the dangers of self-righteousness, making it clear that without him, they could do nothing. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Uh, our second point is Paul's condemnation of self-righteousness. Now, Paul's treatment of self-righteousness is no less scathing than Jesus was. So turn your Bibles to Romans 2. I'm going to uh, start off in verse 17. And I'm, I'm going to read from uh, the message translation. I, I, I just really thought this was, I just thought this was really interesting. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to be uh, reading Romans 2, verses 17 through 24. And uh, it says, So if, if you're brought up Jewish, don't assume that you can lean back in the arms of your religion and take it easy, feeling smug because you're an insider to God's revelation. A connoisseur of the best things of God, informed on the latest doctrines. I have a special word for you of caution, for you are, for you who are sure that you have it all together yourselves, and because you have God's revealed word inside and out. You feel qualified to guide others through their blind alleys and dark nights and confused emotions to God. While you are guiding others, who's guiding you? I'm quite serious. While preaching, don't steal. Are you going to rob people blind? Who would, who would suspect you? The same with adultery, the same with idolatry. You can get by with almost anything if you front it with elegant talk about God and his law. The line from, from scripture, it's because of you Jews that the outsiders are down on God shows it is an old problem that isn't going to go away. You know, uh, the Jews think that through their relationship to the law that they have, 
the essential features of knowledge and truth that can guide and teach the Gentiles. You know, they feel they're, they are the light to those in darkness and the educator of the senseless and the teacher of little children. The Jew who teaches, preaches, and tells others not to steal, commit adultery, and rob temples is himself guilty of the same sins. Now, you know, I'm not saying as disciples. I mean, you know, God uses us as instruments, okay, to, to uh, advance his kingdom throughout the world. Okay, so I'm not saying don't do things. But what I am saying, or well, actually, what the Bible is saying, and I, in this case, uh, you know, uh, 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 Paul's talking to us, is that, you know, uh, don't be fake about it. You know, uh, you, you are who you are. We all have sins. Uh, no one's perfect. Okay, but just always go back to the source, the Word of God. Okay, I mean, really, if you think about it, that's all we need. Okay, to preach His Word. You know, as, as a disciple, how many times have you used the Bible to challenge someone to be obedient to God's Word? when you aren't obedient to the same scripture yourself. You know, I, if pornography is your sin, do you challenge others on that sin? If not spending time with God, having quiet times, is your sin, do you challenge others on that sin? If you are someone who likes to gossip, do you challenge others on that sin? I know uh, uh, throughout my spiritual life, I mean, there are different things that, you know, I... Uh, I go through, we all kind of go through, but I realize that if I'm discipling someone because I don't want to be a hypocrite, then I'm, I'm not going to challenge them on it. You know, which is kind of sad when you think about it. Because wouldn't it be easier for me to just uh, be open and confess and move on yeah. than, than, to, than to kind of hide it and pretend it isn't there? You know, uh, like the Jews in Roman, Romans 2, are you a hypocrite? Are you self righteous? Romans 10.3 says, Since they did, did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. You know, the Jews tried to gain acceptance with God based on their, their own righteousness, demonstrating ignorance of the true righteousness of God. Romans 10.4 says, Christ is a culmination of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. You know, Paul concludes is that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, not man. Paul's letter to the Galatians church also addressed this issue. These disciples were being told that they had to do certain things to be acceptable to God, specifically to be circumcised. You know, I, I remember this was years ago in uh, Oahu, but as a Bible talk leader, you know, I just kind of made up rules for my, uh, for my guys. Now, I would like to follow up with that, you know, that I would like to think that my heart was pure because I'm trying to keep them from sin. So therefore, I tried to be God. Okay, because uh, especially in dating, they, they would go, you know, oh, date's over about 10 o'clock. <laughs> Call me, you know, at 10 o'clock. So I know you're not out and don't lie because I'll know. And so, I mean, that, now, since most of them were military, they said, oh, yes, sir, yes, sir, three bags full. But uh, it was sad when, when I thought about it. But, I mean, you know, I, I would come up with these rules. I would think, think things out, and I said, you know, I can't trust them to do things on their own, so I need to give them a, a checklist of what they need to do. And, I mean, uh, I can laugh about it now, but at the time, I, I mean, I was dead serious, and, and I thought I could really help them, you know, to be more spiritual. Well, I, it really didn't work, okay, but I, I tried. So, you know, we may do things to want to try to help people, and, and, and I would say, hey, look at the heart behind it, okay, because that's what God is looking at. You know, uh, Paul goes so far as to say that this is another gospel and calls those who advocate it accursed or doomed. Turn your Bibles to Galatians 1, 8 through 9. We're going to talk about, uh, uh, well, Paul's going to talk to us, actually. Galatians 1, 8 through 9. 
But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. So, you know, we're talking about is be careful with traditions. Now, there, there's nothing wrong with traditions, but once again, like the Bible talks about, if traditions is before the word of God, then there's a problem with that. Okay? More telling, Paul tells his readers that if righteousness could come from their own actions, then Jesus died for no purpose. You know, and the scripture spells that out in Galatians 2.21. It says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. You know, in Galatians 3.21, Paul further states, is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impact life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. So, you know, Paul's conclusion about the uh, Galatian believers was that they had been foolish in their attempt to be perfected by the flesh. Turn to Galatians 3, 1 through 3, and, and, and we'll see specifically what the Bible says. In the word says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit? Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? You know, it would be an understatement to say that every disciple is plagued by this attitude. You know, it is in our sinful nature to try to do something to merit our salvation. You know, isn't our current society about being works-oriented? You know, that if you do something, then this is going to be your reward. And there's maybe not anything necessarily wrong with that, but if you're talking about your salvation... Well then, you know, I'm, I'm going to go with what the Bible tells us. The costly freedom of grace brought for us by the blood of Jesus with no contribution from us. You know, if you think about it, once again, what did we do to gain the salvation that Jesus, that God has to offer? Nothing. <laughs> you know, it's by his grace. You know, it's, it, it's difficult for our prideful hearts to understand or even appreciate. It is far easier to compare ourselves with one another than it is to recognize that we cannot measure up to the standards of the Holy Spirit. You know, uh, I want to talk about, you know, looking down on people. I know uh, a few years back, you know, uh, Linda and I uh, went home on vacation to visit the Robinson family. Now, our family is, is very, well, I won't say very, we're religious, okay? And so, uh, Saturday night, we're talking about Sunday. And my family said, oh, so we're all going to drive, it was something like six or seven miles to uh, Grandpa's church. Well, you know, Grandpa was a deacon in this church, and most of the time, whenever we all got together, then we would go visit Grandpa's church. Uh, but me now, you know, as a disciple, uh, I spoke up. I said, well, no, uh, Lynn and I will be going to our own church. I said, oh, okay. I mean, I, I want to show them how righteous I was, you know. And uh, my sister asked, well, uh, how far is it? Well, oh, it's just 150 miles. So anyway, Lynn and I get in the car and we drive, drive to... Uh, uh, well, this is back in ICLC days, so an ICLC church. And we were there for a couple hours, maybe. Then we drove 150 miles back. And, I, I mean, I felt good. And then, you know, that's what we're supposed to do. So I remember coming back, and I was talking to, and I don't remember who the minister was here at the time, but 
And I, you know, I had to tell my story. I said, yeah, I don't know what's wrong with them. They want us to go to this church. So I said, man, they, I, I mean, they're a bunch of heathens anyway, you know, and, 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 and all this stuff. I said, but we had an awesome time. You know, well, I was actually lying. It wasn't an awesome time, but anyway. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean <coughs> no, because I, you seriously, it was an outdoor service and we're, we're sitting in the sun and, <laughs> And no one, I mean, this is what I appreciate about the, the Hawaiian churches, you know, and no one came up to say anything. Actually, this couple finally came up after service. And they said, oh, we noticed that you know some of the songs, so you, uh, are you guys disciples? We said, well, yeah, we're from Hawaii. Oh, great, okay, hey, nice meeting you. And then they left, and I kind of sat there, there, and everyone's going off to their, you know, their little picnic lunch. So, you know, I said, well, okay, so, so you walk over to the minister. Hey, I'm Robbie Robinson. And Oh, hey, oh, all the way from Hawaii, oh, great. He says, well, you know, we're having a potluck. Uh, well, actually, he didn't say potluck. We're having a picnic, uh, picnic lunch. Everyone brought their own food and everything. Uh, would you like a bottle of water? I said, oh, oh sure, sure. No one offers any food and anything. So, <laughs> so anyway, I mean, we, hey, hi, everybody. And we ended up leaving. I mean, I had a, honestly, I had a bad attitude. But when I was back home, oh, yeah. Great time, great time. <laughs> but you know, something, something that I, uh, and I, uh, like I said, I don't remember who the minister was at the time, but said, he says, well, bro, he says, uh, you know, I, I think maybe you missed an opportunity. That would have been a great opportunity for you to maybe reach out to your family, you know, and, and uh, you, you know, and he went on and on, and I was sitting there thinking, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> But, but, you know, I had to boast about my conviction and everything. And there's nothing wrong with having a conviction about different things. But I think sometimes, and in my case, honestly, I kind of wanted to show him how righteous I was. When he pointed out I was being self-righteous. You know. So, you know, uh, but, but, you know, don't you like comparing yourself to someone that is not as skilled or smart, smarter or as talented as you? You know, uh, if you're a golfer, I don't know if we have any golfers here, but do, I mean, really, do you ever compare yourself to Tiger Woods? No. <laughs> no. You know, you're going to compare yourself to probably someone like me. I remember swinging the golf club and I'm looking and, oh, the ball's still there. Okay. <laughs> so I said, said okay. I, I actually went out with the Admiral once. Uh, golfing, and uh, he didn't ask me to come back. <laughs> so anyway, I mean that was his problem, not mine. But, <laughs> nah. but you know, uh, in in uh, in, in uh, you know, for for our campus students, you know, do you do you compare yourself with the uh, the struggling 2.2 GPA student, or or with the 4.0 student? You know, I, a married couple, do you want to compare your family and how everything is awesome to maybe the family that's struggling with their teenage kids? You know, I, I think I, a lot of times we can, you know, we want to compare ourselves to maybe the, the lower end of the spectrum instead of ultimately Jesus Christ when he was here. You know, because when we start comparing ourselves to Jesus Christ, I mean, there is no comparison. You know, I don't care how well off you think you are. <laughs> you are, what, what that scripture talking about being filthy rags? Yeah. You know, so, you know, uh, if we are self-righteous, other people don't know as much as you, as us. Other people don't obey God as well as us. And other people aren't quite as righteous as us. You know, in Christ, we know true righteousness. In Christ, we can know the forgiveness of sin that comes to us through grace. Because Christ stood in our place, we benefit from both his sinless life and his sin-bearing death. You know, I, our third point 
And I know this is a little bit different than how we do things, but my, my third point is some practicals to help, help us in our self-righteousness. You know, so one, look at the world through other people's eyes. You know, when you find yourself looking down on someone, think about what their life might be like. Our second one is, ask yourself why you judge other people. You know, think about which circumstances and emotions trigger feelings of self-righteousness in you. And, you know, this can be a tough question to answer, so be honest with yourself. And, you know, often people are judgmental when they're feeling insecure or inferior about themselves. Number three, learn to see the middle ground of situations. Yeah, I, it's all too easy to feel self-righteous when we see the world in black and white terms. But very few things in the world are all good or all bad. Get comfortable with the idea that your own way of thinking has some flaws. And diverse ways of thinking have some good points. Our fourth, fourth point, accept that people do things differently. There's no way to accomplish most things in life, so don't expect people to do things exactly like you. I know I, if you think back when you first got married, you know, thinking about how you and your wife did things differently. I, one of, uh, Lynn and I, one of our first arguments was over how to fold towels. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, because I do it the military way, which is nice, firm, it's small, it's compact, and everything. And, you know, Linda, I, I don't know what she was doing. Kind of <laughs> but, I mean, we argued about that. And, you know, because, I mean, uh, there's a point I think Linda would unfold them and fold them her way, and then I would come back, <laughs> fold them back the correct way. But, you know, uh, and honestly, uh, finally, Linda realized, and she shared with me, I'm sitting here arguing with my husband who wants to fold towels. What am I thinking? <laughs> so then she finally just said, hey, <laughs> fold them however you want. <laughs> you know, five, realize you're not as superior as you think you are. You know, most people overestimate their own abilities and talents. I know I, as you get older, when, you know, when you start reliving your, your sports days, you know, I, I had a real close friend of mine, I was talking about how our, our high school basketball team was so awesome, and he said, Robbie, but our senior year, we really stunk. I said, what? I said, well, I, I, weren't we champions or something like that? He goes, we were eight and 18. I said, I, I said oh, I remember us being 18 and eight. But, yeah, yeah, you know, anyway, we can kind of forget things. You know, and this can lead us to feeling like you're better than other people, even though it's just an illusion most of the time, uh, much of the time. Be aware of your biases and be honest with yourself about your bad qualities as well as your good ones. And number six, stop trying to change other people. Self-righteous people often try to bring others around to their way of thinking, but this won't work. No one should feel pressured to give up their own ideals and quirks for the sake of fitting someone else's preferences. You know, uh, in closing, I know this was a, a short lesson, but I just want to hit it hard and move on, okay? So, in closing, what does the Bible say about self-righteousness? Well, we heard Jesus' point in point one. We heard Paul's view in point two. And we have some practicals in point three. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, the, uh, the Bible says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we can face our sin and bring it to the cross rather than try somehow to be good enough for God. Only the cross 
can see or can we see the grace that covers all of our sin and defeat the constant tendency toward self-righteousness in our hearts.